And again, a career training and campaigning national level field trial retrievers. I explored the question of epistemology from a canine perspective by seeing how retrievers model their understanding of abstract concepts in the space of field trial competition training. I saw more questions come to the fore. How is it that we are able to partner with this extraordinary species, Canis familiaris, familiar perhaps, but still utterly mysterious in their ways? Can we ever really see the world through their eyes, or are we trapped forever in our primate brains? I learned what the word umfeld means, and I thought about how it would be to live life as a bat. Pache Nagel et al. I had some success in field trial competition, became obsessed with the poetry of human-canine working partnerships. I dreamt of field trial training, doodled training exercises on napkins at business lunches, and along the way I became more and more convinced that I was still failing to understand the deeper issues and to ask the right questions. I realized more and more that the interface between humans and non-humans is a fractal boundary. The closer we look, the more detail there is to see. I became fascinated with the manner in which we conceptualize these relationships, how they evolve over time, how they become more than each species participant alone. I imported young stallions from Germany with no training under their belt and decided to see if I could do better at building world-class show jumpers based on an orthogonally different approach to human equine partnerships. I asked more questions about our moral obligations to other species as partners, about what it means to be a genuinely good friend to someone who has more legs than we do, about how this relates to the human concepts of ownership, and, of course, about how it is that we can do all this and think about all this but still be expected, like a splinter shot through otherwise healthy tissue, to castrate our partners along the way. I became more and more convinced, not only that the original question wasn't answerable in any conventional sense, but that there were profound moral implications at play. I stopped castrating my partners though I'm not sure exactly where along the way this became self-evidently required as part of my ongoing exploration of these issues. The decision flowed for everything I had learned. And around this time, I also began my PhD work in complex systems theory with a doctoral subject of quantitative theories of consciousness. In other words, I was sucked right into the event horizon of the so-called consciousness question. After more than a decade of swimming in those near limitlessly broad and deep literary waters, yet more questions rose to the surface of my thinking. Are humans unique in being conscious? Is consciousness something that's genuinely internal to an entity? Or is it also inextricably linked to the external social world in which it is con constituted? What could it mean to construct a consciousness-detecting technology, one that could be applied to other species, other minds, in an objective way? Of course, such questions bring us face to face with the puzzles of sentience, of self-awareness, of socio-emotive constitution, and of essential identity. I began to see how these questions run through not only the study of non-human persons, but also, soon enough, will be part of how we think about non-biological people of a softwareish nature. As is so often the case, the more I learned about these things, the more I came to question whether I understood the fundamentals on which it's all based. I'd like to highlight the use of the phrase non-human persons. Um, excuse me. It was also in those years that I began to actively seek out examples of people who have found gains, ways to engage in qualitatively different relationships with non-human partners. To me, it's these interaction examples 
that can often act as negative test cases to the more far-fetched claims of human uniqueness. As one analytic example, I've sought out people who have demonstrated extraordinary capabilities to form full bandwidth empathetic bonds with other species in particular. Such examples can come from gifted equine mentors, people who form almost psychic bonds with canines, and those who have seemingly put themselves fully inside the social world of marine animals. These people exist. They are rarely the ones you see on TV or read about in the conventional press. They tend to live their lives and express their gifts far from the limelight. They are, almost without exception, shy about their interactions with other human beings. Building trust with them, such that they will open up and share of their life's experiences, can take years or even decades. And not coincidentally, a big percentage of them are zoophiles. Now is where the decades worth of question asking on my part brought me eye to eye with the brutal realities of human politics, human bigotry, and human hatred. For folks who are listening today and might not be facile with the term, zoophiles are human beings whose primary social, emotional, intellectual, and or physical bonds are with non-human partners. The press catnip part of this is, of course, the possibility for sexual relationships that span species boundaries. But only if one of those species is a human being, oddly enough. Nobody really gets worked up over ligers or horse-donkey hybrids or coyote-wolf pairings. But zoophilia, as properly defined, is no more about sex than human same-gender pair bondings are merely about who puts what body part where. That's not to say sex isn't relevant to the discussion. In a real sense, my own seminal question springs from a sexual issue is the morality of castration. And since my research entered these waters, I've not shied away from seeking to understand, to chart, and to grasp the element of sexuality implicit in zoophilia. Reusing a metaphor, sexuality is a skeleton key that unlocks a vast room filled with astonishing new analytic tools, mirror neuron mediated empathy, and the extension of body map awareness socio-emotional symbiosis, physical mutualism, radically transfigured epistemological frameworks, profound reimagining of what language is or can be. But sadly, sex can become the be-all and end-all of any kind of popular interest in the subject of zoophilia, and that perhaps understates the degree to which conventional society is fascinated, obsessed, and simultaneously repulsed and attracted to the idea of cross-species sexuality. Again, the humanity is one of the species involved. My interest in understanding zoophilia, thus, dates back more than a decade and has evolved, shifted, expanded, and contracted over the years. Along the way, I've built a level of trust with individuals around the world who have helped me to gain a more fundamental awareness of the subject. I will say with simple sincerity that there is perhaps no other researcher in the world today who has gained this access, explored these areas, and been able to synthesize these fundamentally ethnographic findings as I have in the last 15 years. Some of these findings I have published publicly. Others I have used to fuel further research as I seek to broaden the scope of the questions I am asking and to refine my conceptual apparatus as my fundamental assumptions have been consistently challenged and re-challenged in due course. Increasingly, I've come to conclude that there's something here that comes to the heart of a wide range of issues that span a diverse range of academic subject areas. Consciousness studies, human sexuality, psychology, both human and non-human, social theory, cultural studies, artistic creativity, linguistics, which I think is right for radical overturning, when perhaps already in works, political theory, morality, ethics, spirituality, 
The list starts to seem grocery-ish, admittedly. But that's what I've seen, and it's what has kept me digging deeper and deeper, despite the obstacles and barriers that have appeared with increasing regularity over the years. And what obstacles they have been. Already in the 1990s, I was exposed to the brutality and oozing evil of human beings who feel that they are granted license to attack an unpopular minority, such as zoophiles. In my contacts with members of the zoophile community, I saw them targeted by opportunistic predators. Having been raised with a profound moral imperative to act when someone defenseless is being attacked without mercy, I found myself drawn inexorably into these instances of violent attacks against that community. I was first outed as a zoophile, putatively, after I refused to aid in the targeting of a young man who was part of my investigations back in the late 1990s. The ultimatum was simple. Hand over his personal information so he could be outed and savaged, or I would be outed in his place. I told the extortionist he could go fuck himself, verbatim, <laughs> and sure enough, he generated hundreds of pages of libelous nonsense to destroy me. My life was forever altered, and from that point forward, it, always, it would always be assumed that I was myself a zoophile. For years, I fought that assumptive designation, telling and retelling the story of my targeting because I would not throw under the bus a young man who was part of my own research project. Eventually, I learned that it was pointless to fight this rear guard battle. Once something is said on the interweb, it's said forever. I went forward with my life. For a time in the early 2000s, I swore off the research, turning more to computer science and to questions of computational complexity. But I came back. I'd see hints of something powerful in what I was exploring and the latent academic in me always compelled me back into the fray. I wanted to learn more, get a deeper view, see a broader range of what exists out there. Incidentally, I still do. I'd been burned badly by my research interest in zoophilia, but I was not permanently deterred. At about that time, I began to engage in informal collaborations with other researchers who were coming to explore the subject, often from within academic psychology. I came to act as a liaison between many researchers who, lacking the credibility and trust within the zoophile community, could not engage in direct research. I was happy to provide that bridge, and a sheaf of published and heavily cited papers came out of that work. This was part of no plan on my behalf. Like so much of life, it happened with a seemingly independent internal logic all its own. In other words, I had started to become involved. Quotes Robert Baer, a retired um, CIA analyst, is saying that involvement is the first step toward understanding. Throughout, I've seen and learned amazing things, wondrous things, frightening things, and sometimes awful things. The world is not all light. There is much darkness there. This is true of the zoophile community, just as it is true of any human community. It is not all wine and roses. There are some genuinely bad people in that community, and some of them have done bad things. However, they are the minority in that community, and over time I have seen those bad people be pushed more and more to the side. Throughout, I have eschewed the role of apologist for that community, aggressively so. If anything, I have chosen to be quite publicly critical of what I have seen, when I have learned of things that are simply not acceptable to me. So much have I been publicly critical of such examples of genuine wrongdoing that some might say I have been more critic of the community than someone who is broadly supportive. So be it. Goethe's quoted, 